I'm Kathleen Staten. I'm the manager of Music Constructed, and my job every day is to organize, create, brainstorm, and work with our founders new ways to help support you, the music educator. And tonight, what that looks like is sitting down with Ashley Lohr, educator and teacher and person extraordinaire, one of the most generous people I've ever met, and so filled with knowledge, and all she wants to do is share it with you. And so, Ashley, uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what we'll be learning tonight. Sure, thank you. Um, and if you could enable me to share my screen so I can uh, share a, a little PowerPoint and a little preview of what this all is, thank you. Um, I'm Ashley Lohr. I teach in mid-Michigan. I teach elementary music and I've taught um, everything from beginner garden on up to sixth grade. And I'm currently, I have one section of beginner garden, young fives. Um, and they're super excited these days because a lot of them are coming in with birthday crowns. I'm this many today. It's, it's so much fun. Um, and I never thought I'd be a huge beginner garden person. And they're, they're one of the highlights of my week. Um, and then on up through fourth grade. And so um, when I started putting together this collection really of um, presentations, um, I, I wanted to do just little snippets and shares of um, some things that I'd been thinking about as an educator, especially through the pandemic and what the pandemic has done for our world in terms of what we're doing and why it is we're doing it. And um, even as I was doing online learning, I, I taught online for over a year because we shut down in March, 2020. And then the following uh, April, I was back finally in class with a, a small percentage of students um, fully masked in my district. And, um, and throughout the course of that online time, I having to really boil down lessons and plans and ideas and figure out, you know, what's really essential, what's really important and why is it important to me? How is this aligning with my philosophy of music education? Has my philosophy changed because of what we're doing right now and what the foreseeable future is going to look like? And so um, a lot of what this, this collection, the curricular puzzle is, is it's, it's really meant as a, a bit of an introspective view as to what you might be currently doing as an educator and what you might be doing or what you might be looking for moving forward, while also being an advocate for yourself, for your students, and, and when you're communicating the, the different things that we do, um, especially with our vocabulary in and um, through to our administration, to our communities, and people who really don't know our language yet, but are going to learn it from us. Um, so this is a collection, and I'm just going to share with you little bits and snippets of the different parts of this curricular puzzle. And um, hopefully you will find some of the right pieces for you. And in the long run, I just hope that this causes you to think about what you're doing and how you can either continue because you are, you're feeling proud of the way that you are going about educating children or how you might change a little bit of your vocabulary or the way that you um, even work with your philosophy in music education. Um, my contact information is on this slide, but Kathleen will be sure to send it out. If you have any further questions, um, I am here and I, I would love to talk more about this. And um, one of the things that I've loved about this too is talking with other educators and seeing how they feel about this because some of these things, I, people have been thinking about but haven't really um, pursued as much or maybe we haven't felt like we've been able to pursue it because we've been in survival mode for a few years. And so um, anyway, I hope this this helps as, as we're moving forward. Um, the big takeaway for me when it comes to our curriculum and how we are examining what we're doing with our curriculum is this is really being an advocate for yourself and for your classroom, for your students. And so as you're looking at what you're currently doing and just analyzing the, the different uh, curricular um, access points that you have, um, really think about how you are going to become a um, really a, a, a more informed educator and be able to inform others as to what you're doing and why you're doing it and, and having that 
really positive spin on it as well. Um, so this is just all up the line of advocacy because if I go to my administrator and I say, hey, I'm doing this, this lesson set, it's, I'm going to be teaching the kids this for the next two weeks. And I'd love for you to come in and check this out because I know you know Bloom. I know you know Bloom's taxonomy. And this is how we're getting from point A to the, the tip of the pyramid. And I'd love for you to come in and see how we develop this together. You can use that language to advocate for yourself again and for your classroom and for the many things that you do for yourself and for your students. So the first set uh, in this curricular puzzle um, is a look at uh, Vygotsky, Piaget, and Maslow. Oh my. <laughs> and um, it's a review about what these cognitive theorists observed and learned as they were working with children and with um, even young adults and um, looking at cognitive de development and how people get from point A to point B. A lot of these theorists, they're, they're older, their names that have been around for a while, but the language pieces that they've used within their theories are still things that we use today. For example, scaffolding, that was a Vygotsky thing. And if you've ever talked about scaffolding or how important scaffolding is, then that's, that's directly linked to Vygotsky. And so in this first collection of, um, of curricular examination, um, I talk a little bit about his theory of cognitive development. Um, unfortunately, Vygotsky passed away a little bit too early, and his theories were a little bit lost for a while, but theorists really spent time looking at what Vygotsky had done on up to 1934 when he passed away and published his work about 40 to 50 years after he'd passed, and it still has been a, a big component to, again, what our curriculums look like and, and how we understand child development. And a zone of proximal development too, I, I talk about how children know what they know, and then they need that scaffolding piece of a, an adult, a grown-up, a mentor to help guide them through. And then we have Piaget. And if, you, if you're like me, I hadn't really spent a lot of time thinking about these people since I was an undergraduate, a sophomore, and half the time I was asleep on my table in college, quite frankly, because I was trying to juggle so many different things and I just needed a nap sometimes during these, these conversations. So for me, it, it was really nice to start to look back at these theorists and the things that they had done and be able to apply it directly to what I know and what I've observed with my students. And, you know, when you're an undergraduate, or even if you, you look at this a little bit within your master's program, um, it's different when you have this real life experience with children. And even if you're new to education, you can look at these different theories and see how, yeah, I can get why this theorist thought this way. And so Piaget is a little bit different from Vygotsky because Vygotsky really focused on, well, you know, we, we can do the, these things, we can scaffold for, for these kids, and that will help them develop, which yes, we've, we know that that's true. Um, but Piaget said, you know what, but there are, there are like these built in stages of cognitive development. Like a kid is not going to be able to tie their shoe during the sensory motor stage. They, they do not have those connections in their brain. They are not wired for that yet. And so, um, so Piaget did have a, an idea of what Vygotsky had said and examined his findings, but then also went further with his um, theory of cognitive development. And if you think about, especially the pre-operational and concrete operational stages, if, if you're an elementary music educator like me, um, this is where we spend most of our days, most of our hours working with kids within these two different levels and um, really considering what what their brains might be doing during these um, ages is, is really, really helpful for scaffolding your own lessons in, in a way. But then of course, before Piaget, before Vygotsky, a lot of people say you really need to talk about Maslow. Now, granted, Maslow was a little bit, just a little bit after Piaget and Vygotsky. I mean, all, all of these, these different theories were, were happening around the mid 1920s on up to, I mean, really there, there's continued to be discussed today. Bloom's taxonomy was just revised uh, 20 years ago. 
so these things are still developing. Um, but Maslow spent a lot of time talking about, yeah, this education stuff, this is great. But if kids or adults for that matter are not having their basic needs met, if not, if they're not having these psychological needs met, there is no way that they're going to be able to hit that higher point of self-fulfillment, self-actualization. And so in this series, I also talk about what we can do as educators and, and um, just a glimpse at how Maslow's hierarchy of needs can really take a, a, a big stand within our music education world and, and how, you know, we can as educators and we can encourage those basic needs to be met within our classroom and how we can encourage that classroom culture. And of course, so um, SEL is huge right now, social emotional learning. And that's, that's what this is. It, I feel like SEL is just rebranded from Maslow's hierarchy in a lot of ways. Um, and so in this first set, I go through these three, Vygotsky, Piaget, and Maslow, oh my, <laughs> and talk about how these, these foundations really can help you communicate again with oh your administrators your understanding, but then also um, move forward and how these might shape a little bit of how you are interacting with your children. I heard something. Is someone trying to say something? I think it was an accidental unmute. Oh, okay. I get and, that. And I do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and just a note to all of you um, who are joining us. So Ashley's doing a, a big survey tonight, um, and but she's actually doing a deeper dive into each one of these topics that will be follow-up. Yes. Uh-oh, are we, are we here? Okay, I think we're still here. Uh-oh. Um, I okay. think, oh, there. Okay, all right. If you can hear me, I think I lost you for a second there, Kathleen. Um, so you go. do you wanna say again what you were saying? I think, if, I don't know if it froze up for everyone else. Yeah, it, there's been some weird internet freezing. I was just saying that Ashley's doing a deeper dive into each one of these philosophies in follow-up PD that you can view asynchronously on your own time. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and so the, the second one, so there are five asynchronous uh, pieces to the curricular puzzle. And um, this, the second one, moving past the first three, um, I go into discussing Bloom's taxonomy, which again, you've got that Maslow before Bloom thing. If, if you've ever heard that before, well, now you know Maslow and, and, and Bloom. Um, and I talk about how Bloom's taxonomy has been a really, really big part of how a lot of our curriculums are created and how um, there's justification for certain things happening. Um, and the the more time I spend with Kodai, I, I'm not a, an expert in Kodai. I, I'm, I'm ORF certified. I, I've taken my Kodai level one and I'm taking some um, other Kodai classes right now. But the more time I spend with Kodai, I'm like, wow, this is like, this is very bloomy for sure. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, Bloom's taxonomy is, again, it's another pyramid. And it's once kids are feeling like their basic needs have met, been met, then they can start to get into really learning this, this educational piece. <laughs> yes, the child must Maslow before they can bloom. Yes, I love that. I'm just looking at the chat. Um, and so in the second piece of this, the second uh, uh, asynchronous recording, I talk about Bloom's taxonomy um, and give some examples of ways that I use it in my classroom. And, and I think many others use uh, Bloom's taxonomy as well. And um, getting through from the remember, understand, apply, analyze into the evaluation. And then that, that pinnacle, that creation stage, which is just so very important for overall development. And um, I think to self-efficacy for our, our children and, and for our world. Um, and then I, this is a pyramid structure that I've, I've put together personally. Normally you'll see a Bloom's taxonomy pyramid that has straight sides, just like what we saw with Maslow. But um, I think so much about what my classroom looks like. And I like the idea of steps. I mean, we step onto that remember stage, we step up to understand, we step up to apply and oh, we might take a backtrack down to that understand again if we need to. And so um, when you're thinking about Bloom's taxonomy too, I hope you'll think about how it's really, there's a lot of steps around on this pyramid too, even before you get to that, that top tier. And then 
I talk about Bruner Spiral Curriculum. Now, Bloom and Bruner are a little bit, they, they're so complementary, um, but some of them are, uh, they are different. So Bloom is like, this is, these are the steps and, and this is how you get from point A to point B. And Bruner's like, yeah, but also we, we might do this and we might bounce around to, the, to these different areas. And um, if you've ever heard about uh, spiral curriculum, um, then this is, uh, I, I discuss what that looks like. And, and really um, he references it briefly in his process of education, which is just a little, little publication from 1960. Um, but I find a lot of educators and then a lot of lessons in general within different curriculums do this naturally, because really this is how we learn. And um, so if you, you look here, you can see that the different years of when these different um, theories were coming out and Bruner's really in 1960 in the late 1950s 1960 he's taking all of this information that has been available and has compiled it um, quite a bit into this idea of a spiral sequence sequence or curriculum and his theory indicated that cognition occurs in really three stages, the inactive, the iconic, and the symbolic. And I think those align really well with the 2014 music standards of responding, performing, and creating. So I give you a glimpse into that. And if you're a fan of the song Apple Tree, I, I go through and, and detail these. And I, I don't know about you, but I've been doing a lot of Apple Tree <laughs> these days with a little puppet and, um, and, and other things. But um, the I, I detail how this works well with um, apple tree and, and um, potentially with other uh, pieces as well, other songs that you do within your classroom. So that's the second curricular piece. Now the third and the fourth curricular pieces, I get into trying to help you hopefully think about what you're doing and why it is you're doing it. And so these are just different curricular facets. Um, the first one I talk about repertoire choices and, um, and, and hope that you spend some time thinking about what you're choosing and why you're choosing it. And also talk about how a lot of our repertoire choices, um, even up until about five years ago or so, were very are very driven um, by a, a westernized uh, idea or mentality of um, music education and how um, I, I feel that especially in the past five years, there, there's been a, a bigger glimpse at um, the world and how, um, how music can be shaped a little bit differently. And I, I think part of that does have to do with COVID and, and people looking at things that are happening around the world and incorporating them into their um, environments. And then in that, that third piece still, I talk about process method or approach, which whichever you choose to use or whichever you choose to say. Um, and I talk about how the way that I go about doing things is, is very bloomy. So you'll see that the, the bloom words are here, remember and understand, apply and analyze, evaluate, create. But I talk about how bloom, um, you, can, you can use it throughout the course of a lesson or, or, or multiple lessons to reach that create stage. Um, and then also, there's there's some spiraling there as well with within um, that structure, and then in the next curricular piece, I get into a discussion about the different elements of music and how we are using these different language pieces within our classroom, and then how we're communicating these pieces with our students and how we're helping them to embody what this this foreign language of music really is and and what it feels like and and how we can do these things together. And so um, I also discuss about how these are the different access points to music education. What are you using? How are you using these things, these things that you have access to or might not have access to yet, but hopefully will in time? How, what are the language pieces that you're using? How are you using your language? Are you using the actual vocabulary or are you using words that children understand first as part of that scaffolding and then adding the, those vocabulary pieces maybe a little bit later on once they've had some experience with these different concepts like beat or pulse or different rhythms. And then what is the way in which you're using them? 
And so I also give a little lesson and just give you some glimpses into some different ways that I look at these different repertoire choices and um, implement them over the course of a few lessons in a few years. And, and I do that too with um, Hop Old Squirrel, another classic from the elementary world. Um, and so you'll, you'll get the chance to see that. And here's a little glimpse at that as well. So the repertoire piece, the process method, elements of music, the communication, and how you can go about integrating some of these ways that you are choosing to use these different um, vocabulary pieces and how you, you might look at what you're doing and maybe you're doing a lot of one thing and maybe not a lot of another. And, and maybe you need to um, consider changing a couple of things that you're doing. And, um, and so that's, that's all part of that fourth curricular piece. And finally, the unanswered questions, the last piece of this curricular puzzle, um, I, I am not the person to tell you what you should be doing or how you should be doing it. Rather, I'm hopeful that you can take these, these little bite-sized PDs and really just thoughtfully process through the different things that you're doing within your classroom and how, again, you might be just fine and you might be super happy with the things that you're doing, or maybe you might want to think about what you're doing and, and there might be some room for change and for growth. And I just, I think about the way that I'm teaching music even this week and how it is vastly different from how it was September of 21 and September of 20 and September of 19 and how these things have evolved. And so the, the final one is, is really, really a big time introspective of how are you doing? What are your methods? How are you going about educating um, children? And what, what might you do moving forward? And so those are some unanswered questions because, well, you might be able to answer them a little bit, but I, I'm not going to answer them for you. Those are questions that um, I'm hopeful that you would spend some time uh, thinking about and considering for yourself. And, and I talk you through that. And that is pretty much a, a, a broad glimpse at what this curricular puzzle looks like and um, what these different uh, pieces might look like. So if maybe one or two of these uh, different things sounded good to you, like you really want to review on Bloom and Bruner, or you'd like to consider, you know, what are, what are the language pieces that you're using and, and how does your curriculum look and, and how are you using specific things from one curriculum and how might you use things from another curriculum. Um, so the, the really neat thing about, I think these little PDs and, and what Music Constructed has been able to do is they let you tap into the things that would interest you the most. And you can go through the whole series from top to bottom, or you can just kind of take a, a glimpse at some of the, the things individually if you want a refresher or a review, or just need some extra PD time that is actually applicable to what you're doing in your classroom versus, you know, the whatever else is sometimes offered. So. And that's, that's the, the curricular puzzle in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or, or I, there were a couple of things that were in the chat that I really enjoyed reading um, about the correlation between some of these ideas in other subject areas or how you personally apply them in your music classroom. So I, I, I go through and I, I discuss these different things, but um, does anyone else have anything else they'd like to potentially add to the conversation? You can take yourself off mute or you can put your thoughts in the chat. And if you're just waiting until you have a chance to uh, peruse these courses so that you can answer those questions better, that's fine too. <laughs> We'll be sending out tomorrow a link to this session and um, and to reach Ashley directly if you have questions, um, and as well as information about how you can obtain the videos to further your learning on these subjects. I think it's easy for us to forget all of these really important um, ideas and the research behind them into the development of children and uh, what they're really capable of because we're so focused on our topic area and on the revolving door that is our music room. Um, so we're so pleased that you took this time to uh, 
extend your own learning tonight um, that will hopefully enable you to interact with your students and our subject area even better. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight at Music Constructed, and we hope to see you again soon. Drop us a line uh, if there's something you're looking for or if we can help you in any way, and watch your email box tomorrow. Thanks for coming.